I'm Patrick Hughes from Queen's University Belfast, uh, chair for this panel. And on behalf of our, my co-conveners of the Post-Structural Politics Working Group, that's Christina Olgemoller and Patrick Pinkerton, <clears throat> I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second in our virtual series of events entitled Governing Subjectivities and the Performativity of Governance. I want to thank Patrick Pinkerton in particular for his hard work in putting together this virtual series of events after we've all been impacted as, uh, as, as we know. It has been no mean feat. Um, I also want to extend sincere thanks to today's panelists for their dedication in making this a success. Before we dive in, just a quick note that after this panel, there will be a short break of 30 minutes until 3.30, and we hope you can join us for a second panel on identity, performativity, and representation. So just bear that in mind. Okay, enough from me to today's panel, which is, which is called Mobilities, Subjectivities and Technologies. It brings together papers examining the creation of infrastructures and regimes of governance with the experiences of those produced as the mobile or aesthetic subjects of those forms of power. We're looking forward to insights drawn from a wide variety of sources, including science fiction novelists, theoretical reflections on space and time, and colonial geopolitical imaginaries. Our speakers include, you're about to hear them, Hattie Cancino, who is a doctoral research student at Newcastle University, Dr. Matt Davies, who is senior lecturer in international political economy at Newcastle, who will present on behalf of himself and Dr. De Lacy Tedesco of the University of Exeter, who sadly can't be with us today, but we're very glad to have uh, Matt with us. And finally, Professor Maya Zephus, the illustrious co-founder of this very PPWG at BISA, and who is Professor of International Politics at the University of Manchester, but you knew that already. So each speaker has 18 minutes, and let's get started. First up, it's Harriet. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Good. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do today is sort of take you down a journey on a journey down the road. Um, it's a it's a long road. Um, you might say it's got many a winding turn. Um, recently, however, it's um, been repaved. Um, so this particular road links a town called Praia de Pipa, which is like a, a paradisiacal beach town in um, the northeast of Brazil, to a lot of wider national and international infrastructures. So Pipa, um, you know, it's one of these white beaches, warm sea, palm trees everywhere. Um, and it's one of Brazil's most prominent sun, sea, sand tourist destinations. Um, and this prominence is very much reflected within sort of state economic plans, you know, um, sort of allocation of resources and, and things like that. But what I want to look at today is that simply viewing this road as a link between sort of Pipa and, and you know, these, these wide places would be to actually escape the way that, it, that as a space in itself, um, it kind of enables and entrenches a lot of um, different logics such as circulation um, within and between the, the places and the people that it links. So the road, you know, m as much as anywhere is a space where plans and ambitions and the, and the grind of daily life are carried out. It kind of links all of its diverse users together with goods and ideas that come in and out of the tourist destination. So what I'm going to do is just bring together a couple of sort of the diverse political effects that I saw stemming from the actual repaving of this road, which happened in 2018, um, and relate them to this idea of paradise. Um, paradise is kind of very important in PIPA, um, as I've described. Uh, you know, it's a very fundamental um, imaginary of the tourist economy there and frames kind of a lot of the aesthetic experiences of, of the users of this road. Um, the, these imaginaries of paradise in Brazil are very important, um, kind of stem from the era of colonization. Um, Sergio Buarque de Orlando argues that they, they kind of actually constitute um, a central element of, of Brazilian national imaginaries, um, kind of the roots of Brazil, its foundation. Um, so I'm going to, I'm doing this to argue that the kind of sensation of mobility, of actually being a mobile subject, that this road engenders kind of entrenches a lot of hierarchical relationships um, that the tourist economy builds on through its encouragement of circulation, um, whilst at the same time creating a stage for kind of possible redrawings of those relationships through mobility itself. 
um, in you know that ultimately these highlight the kind of contingency of this these exclusionary relationships. Um, and just as an aside, the research is based off a couple of periods of, of ethnographic fieldwork I did in the town in 2018 and 19. So this was kind of just before and after the road was repaved. Um, and what I'm going to do today is focus on the day-to-day -day journeys of just a, a few precarious workers in the tourism industry. Um, just to kind of begin to consider how the micropolitics of their everyday mobilities produce these different effects. Uh, first, I'm going to look a little bit at, at sort of um, a theoretical understanding and some background on the roads repaving um, before kind of looking at the effects of this. Um, mostly going to consider the way that the roads aesthetic form actually suggests particular journeys and then think about the way it acts as a, both a governing device and a stage which enables um, sort of moments of democratic politics. So, um, just in terms of some theory that I found particularly useful in thinking this through, um, the work of, of Penny Harvey has been really good. Um, she looks a lot at, ro at roads as, as relational spaces, which she says manifest the political. Um, and then um, also looking at sort of um, some Ranciarian work, specifically a performance theory called um, Andre Le Pecky, who discusses the role of kinetic piecing. So this is kind of ensuring that everybody knows when and where to move. Um, uh, you know, I'm kind of arguing that the road constitutes part of this. Um, so he builds on Rancier for this uh, by looking at the development of a police order of movement itself. So um, just as an aside, for Rancier, the police order is, and I quote, that which prescribes our reality or our sensibility. So it's the forms of governments which delimit that which we can know or feel. So Le Pecky actually reminds us that movement itself is often an aim of policing, you know, when and where people should go. Um, and then finally, I'm considering the way that um, Jeff Hoysons and Claudia Aradell look at the sociality of mobility um, and the way that it's an imminent, um, imminent itself to democratic practice. Um, and again, following Rancière, democracy is an imminent quality which was, um, becomes obscured through such policing. So it's kind of thinking through things on that level. And hopefully what all of this does together is help us move away from a potentially depoliticizing discussion um, that quite often happens around infrastructure as maybe just being a kind of a fixed leaping off point for mobility or something like that, or potentially invisible. Um, what I'm actually really interested in is the way that infrastructures such as, as roads like this can be drawn and redrawn and things like that through, through these moments of politics. Um, right, so going back to the road then, um, as I've mentioned, the repaving of this road was something that happened whilst I was kind of um, involved in, in PIPA. So beforehand, everybody talking about the road would be complaining about it, right? It was, um, you know, potholed, dirty, traffic was slow, it was dangerous. And basically just kind of people would say an embarrassing first encounter with the town because, you know, paradise shouldn't kind of carry these visual reminders of poverty, right? So then in 2017, State Governor Robinson Faria allocated about 8 million reais of funding, and this came from a mixture of federal, state budgets, um, <coughs> excuse me, contributions from development banks, etc., cetera, to, to go to this resurfacing. Um, and he did this in the hope that this would pave the way for the town to, and I quote, receive a higher number of visitors and new investments that would drive the economy, generating work and income for all. So what's kind of clear here in the way that he's talking about it is that whilst the road, um, you know, in, in, in what he's talking about is justified in terms of, of the difference it would make to the lives of the town res town's residents, their journeys are actually kind of obscured from this, right? What's actually important, and there's a hierarchy here, is the journeys of tourists. Um, so this, and this is kind of a very central argument to what I'm looking at, actually ends up creating a hierarchy. Um, and that, that entrenches this idea that tourism is the single guarantor of, of like employment in the area, of any income. Um, and these, these hierarchies are kind of really important. So um, Bernadette Vicuña Gonzalez uh, looks at roads in the Philippines as well. And she tells us there that, that roads in this sort of sense can be seen to be a, a material inscription of hierarchical relationships such as this on the landscape, um, especially in terms of, of their relationship to colonialism. So this road in Pipa is, is kind of, you know, carefully structured concrete and it's providing this sleek black line through paradise on the outside. 
And that very much tells its users where to go and who should be using it. But what's kind of crucial to note to understand kind of how this works is that that inscription isn't just a relationship in space, but this is also a relationship in time. So as Penny Harvey says, roads don't only connect, they also kind of solidify the distance between places as something that needs connecting. Um, and in Brazil, it's important to note that regional differences are very much characterized by distinct temporal associations. So the Northeast, where Pipa is, is kind of seen as this backwards region in comparison to the very metropolitan South. Um, and this association is, is central to a lot of nation building projects and, and um, kind of stems from, from colonial political control as well. So also in Pipa, this road kind of carried a similar function. Um, the history of the town, you get a lot of stories about sort of the spatial liberation of Pipa from the carving out of this road. Um, which was actually in the service of tourism in the first place. And it kind of, the way that this brought, you know, fishermen into modernity, et cetera. So Pipa, you've got this road cleaving its way through the landscape, which is necessarily consigned to the past. Um, you'll see a lot of small roads as you go along it, uh, but these are rough, you know, they're quite often dirt tracks. And you very much, it emphasizes this appearance that the only real route, the only one that actually matters is uh, within contemporary modernity anyway, would be this one taking you to paradise, which is very much a locale of kind of consumption um, at the other end. Um, so we see as, as Deserto tells us that roads have got this capacity then to act as a temporal frontier. They mark out, I suppose, kind of the legitimacy of, of different modes of production, etc., through what they actually choose to connect. Um, and in paper, paradise, kind of like at the end of the road, becomes reified as this object worthy of travel. It's the destination. So Roncier highlights this sort of effect as the very functioning of the police order. Um, and I quote, the police is that which says that here on this street, there's nothing to see and so nothing to do but move along. It asserts that the space for circulating is nothing but the space for circulation. And residents that use the road to reach the kind of jobs that, that the governor um, spoke of, therefore in this kind of binary opposition i suppose aren't here as mobile subjects but they're static they're passive they're subject to this very spatio-temporal fixity and it's, it's kind of rendering them distinct from modernity um and the road i suppose kind of acts as the bridge which directs people to move over them to the place where they can buy things um so what i kind of said so far then just to sum up is that the aesthetic form of the road as it were, um, the way it kind of speaks to modernity and movement, kind of acts as a rejoinder to its users that, that PIPA is this obvious just destination for journeys. So for tourists, that clearly works on this level of depicting where they're heading um, or naturalising the fact that this was probably their, their sole engagement with the area. But I want to think about briefly about workers in the town to understand how this also serves to naturalise dependence on the tourist economy. Um, it establishes it because it's going to paradise as the most legitimate form of income in the area. So Maddie Stella, who was a, a young worker in a sort of tourist activity center, you know, with um, lines through the trees and things, she told me about how much she really likes taking this journey. So she actually lives outside of town and, and gets the bus in every day, about 40 minutes, um, because she feels that coming to Pipa actually enables certain things in her life. She doesn't mind the length of the journey or the cramped buses or the long waits that she has to make because to her, the road is, and I quote, the most beautiful thing because it brings her to Pipa where she can meet people from all over the world and fundamentally somewhere she can be herself. So to Maristella, this fact of making the journey, it's the actual doing the traveling, despite its conditions, kind of seems to contribute to this idea that she's taking part in the very same act of mobility as that of tourists. She's making, she's traveling again, kind of in time along this sleek black road to paradise, where she seems to feel she can act a particularly modern cosmopolitan vision of, of perhaps what she feels like life should be and what mobility in itself enables. So this is something she seems to think only available in places like Pipa, it's that temporal distinction again. But it's worth pointing out here that this, the reason that Maricela doesn't actually live in Pipa where she works is the cost of rent. It's astronomically higher there than, than the surrounding area. 
And her joy at taking the journey seems to obscure perception of this fact. Um, it seems to bring in this effective sensation that, that she is being included in this paradisiacal locus of wealth. So this kind of bears a lot of similarity to what Susan Buck Morse draws out of um, Benjamin's arcades projects. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of expansion of the Parisian boulevards kind of drew upon this temporal bricolage as well in order to impart a sensation of inclusion and equality to the city's residents by bringing them into modernity, all the while having the effect of excluding them from actually being able to live there um, and exporting them to the city's outskirts. So in Pipa, the road seems to kind of have the same sort of effect in that it gives Maricela this feeling of inclusion whilst also encouraging the exclusionary social arrangements that award the centre of the town to tourists and tourism. So she can be there and take part in the wonders that she seems to think it brings, so long as she goes home at the end of the day and frees up the valuable rental property for those who can pay more rent. So this road gives a sensation of freedom to move, where in fact there is none. As we've seen so far then, this spatio-temporal spatio montage within the landscape that the road creates actually seems to kind of strengthen this desire for inclusion within modernity via the actual exercise of mobility and the interlinking sensation of being a mobile subject that this mobility produces, all the while naturalising people's economic spatial uh, exclusions. So it very much acts as kind of part of the police order. But what I kind of want to draw attention to as well, now that we've seen the road and journeys taken along it contribute to this order, is that actually kind of some other effects can stem from this. Um, so I want to quickly bring in the experience of two other young workers to highlight the way in which the road also enables perception of kind of the ultimate contingency of tourism in these contexts. So mm -hmm. in doing that, I just want to um, argue, as do Jeff, um, Jeff and Claudia, that mobility constitutes this terrain of exchange. Um, and just briefly, the kind of journeys that they take along it. So firstly, I've got Susanita. She's a young Argentine worker who works, who has spent about six months living in Pipa working as a waitress. And she doesn't really travel along the road because she can't afford it. Um, but then next to her, uh, and she also says to me that if she's going to be working a crappy job, it might as well be by the beach, right? But then um, next to her, there's another young worker called Leleco who works in a mobile phone shop um, off the main square. Now, he has previously been working inside of the same branch of that shop, but in Natal, the state capital, um, and regularly kind of travels between the two. But he's actually thinking of transferring back to Natal because Pipa doesn't pay him enough. The wages are very low. Um, what I kind of find interesting about this is that he doesn't blame that. He, he says that this is because a lot of the jobs are held by Argentine workers, but he doesn't blame this on um, who do work for minimum, under minimum wage. But the fault there is actually of the bosses who know this and exploit it as opposed to the workers. So what we kind of have is this uh, terrain of, of exchange there of, of them both being mobile subjects who encounter one another as a result of their own mobility, but can only perceive the sort of unnatural social order of tourism here, I don't mean unnatural, but um, the way that it's, it's, it's held together because of their mobility, it's what enables them to, to meet one another. Um, and therefore this kind of brings into questioning the, the, the idea that tourism is the only possible form of exchange, that, that of, of income in the state, that things are have to be that way right so it, it allows these moments of, of democratic rupture which kind of carve out a space for questioning whether tourism should be this only only kind of deserving of object of development the only guarantor of income so to just bring all those threads together quickly we can kind of see that the relationship between the road and the mobilities it enables brings upon its formal qualities and the recourse to modernity and circulation that they imply the road therefore serves to sort of materially inscribe a set of colonial relationships. It exploits already existing and localised spatio-temporal hierarchies in order to kind of entrench this unequal social order. I've also discussed that looking at road users like Maristella shows us that a particular effect that stems from this statement of hierarchy is that the road acts as an encouragement to its users to travel and to accept the knowledge that it imparts that travel is a good in and of itself. 
and the, in this sense that it acts as a peace order and, and limits the ways in which people who travel along get are able to think about paradise, sort of the role of tourism and their place within the town. But I've also pointed to the way that the same road provides quite a literal terrain for the disruption of the idea of that, that tourism is the only possible form of income for the state. Um, and actually the very journeys that, that such workers make along it enables perception of the difficulties faced by others within an exploitative economy. So what I've kind of been pointing to then is that the aesthetic perception of infrastructure underpins and is produced in conjunction with these kind of simultaneously controlling and democratizing possibilities of um, quotidian mobilities, um, which kind of points to maybe a different way of thinking about infrastructure in a more kind of directly political way than as a jumping off point for mobilities, which simply kind of go over it. Um, and yeah, could be a useful sort of way to look in the future. But um, I think that's time. So <laughs> that is thank you. perfectly on time, Hattie. Thank you so much. <laughs> you minutes. Uh, very happy chair. Uh, that I, I think that has sparked a lot of ideas and questions that people are going to have. Remember, at the end, we're going to come back with with questions for everybody, including Hattie. Uh, but now we're going to um, swim along over or drive on the road to paradise that is Matt Davies. You've set the bar very high for me, Patrick. Um, I, I, I think I've unmuted. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, good. Um, yes, let me begin with uh, apologies from my co-author, Delacy Tedesco, who had conflicting obligations and wasn't able to join us. Um, so I am speaking a little in her name, but I, I will take responsibility for the errors and problems in what I'm going to present today. Uh, it's a work in progress, so of course we welcome any comments, critiques, and suggestions that people may have. The paper emerges from our conversations around three topics and their possible connections. Uh, first, problems related to political subjectivity and the aporias of the modern subject. Second, challenges to conventional understandings of international relations that thinking about the politics of cities can provoke. And third, questions around the insights into politics and subjectivity that popular culture can afford. So the paper explores these connections with a focus on subjectivity, arguing that engaging with the city as an aesthetic subject provides glimpses into an unenclosed, uh, yet that is to say not yet interpolated collective subjectivity, which would otherwise be repressed in the figure of the individual psychological subject. I'll elaborate on all those terms. In concrete terms, our contribution aims to engage and extend the potential for an aesthetic subject after Mike Shapiro, that does not psychologize, interiorize, individualize, but in, instead emerges through the circulations and densities and sensoriums of everyday life. We aim to articulate the aesthetic subject that Shapiro situates in the contemporary city. We aim to develop a notion of the urban or the city itself as another aesthetic subject, one with a capacity to act and to influence the actions of others. We wish to recognize that both the individual and the urban aesthetic subjects are made possible by forms of uh, constituent outsides or others, right? So the other of the individual or the other of the urban. We hope to theorize the sensory, material, and affective practices that make the space of the operatic hiatus or gap a place of active political configuration and reconfiguration and not a hollow or an absence. We aim to read these processes through aesthetic sites that help us develop material metaphors for aesthetic subjects. And we hope to make explicit the epistemological contributions of feeling, touching, sensing, and locating. Now these points make for a complex agenda, and while I intend to weave some of them, at least through the presentation, I don't address them just separately, discreetly. Instead, the structure of the presentation will begin with an explanation of the aesthetic subject as a concept to help us understand the unenclosed collective subjectivity that Jody Dean asserts. We do this via considerations of Michael Shapiro's and Gayatri Spivak's interventions into debates on subjectivity. We then turn to a discussion of the city as an aesthetic subject in the novels of China Miaville, and we conclude with some very brief remarks on global cities as critical as a critical approach to understanding the modern international uh, international relations and how this conception of the subject might impact our thinking of cities and urbanization for IR. Now, in our con conversations around the aporias of subjectivity, Delacy and I were both struck by Jody Dean's intervention. Sorry, Jody Dean's inversion of Al Althusser's famous formulation of interpolation. So where Althusser see, sees the individual as interpolated as a subject, for example, through the famous hailing of the police officer, 
Dean suggests that this universalizes and naturalizes the individual and presents a view of the limits imposed on individuality by becoming a subject. In contrast, she offers an analysis of the subject interpolated as an individual, a depoliticizing enclosure of collective subjectivity affected by bourgeois ideology understood as European modernity, instrumental reason, and the emergence of the capitalist mode of production. Individuation encloses into singular bounded, a singular bounded body, collective bodies, ideas, effect, affects, desires, and drives, she says. We will suggest that following Dean's argument, individuality produces a distribution of the sensible that must be distributed in order, this must be disrupted in order to bring such collectivities into practical and political engagements. The notion that individuality produces a distribution of the sensible also appears in Mike Shapiro's account of subjectivity. In studies in transdisciplinary method, Shapiro begins by explaining his dissatisfaction with how political science conceives of the subject. In conventional political analysis, the subject is an actor with certain psychological attributes or attitudes, and the goal of political science is to correlate these attributes with political behaviors. Against the psychological subject, Shapiro proposes a concept of aesthetic subject subjects, those who, through artistic genres, articulate and mobilize thinking, he says. He illustrates this notion with the figure of Eteocles from Aeschylus' Seven Against Thebes, citing Vidal Nasque. Uh, v Shapiro points out that Eteocles is not a human being, but a figure in a Greek tragedy. The conflicting values of the polis that he embodies are values and not states of mind. Shapiro's aesthetic subject is not a reified and enclosed in the individual. It emerges through the engagement with the artistic figure. Gatry Spivak, in her scattered speculations on the question of value, makes a slightly different argument about the place of aesthetics in the conception of the subject. For subject, for Spivak, idealist and materialist philosophies assert mutually exclusive predications of the subject. The idealist predication of the subject is consciousness or the subject's irreducible intendedness towards the object. For materialism, the predication of the subject is labor power or the irreducible possibility that the subject is more than adequate to itself, hence power. In their mutual exclusivity, Spivak finds that these predications of the subject are metonymic accounts, parts standing in for a putative holes. They cannot afford a rigorous concept of the subject, but rather they invite fictive accounts. Thus, like Shapiro, Spivak opens the exploration of subjectivity to the aesthetic, that is, not only to genres, but also to perceptions and sensations as she explores the possibilities that political subjects orientations towards wild practice rather than theoretically grounded analysis. However, in her deconstruction of the idealist and materialist predications of the subject, Spivak does not eschew the irreducible intendedness of the subject towards the object, nor the irreducible superadequacy of the subject towards itself. Subjectivity, however conceptually problematic, remains a wild practice in politics. Now, Shapiro's and Spivak's arguments about subjectivity by opening the subject to an aesthetic and not merely positive account of subjects indicates an approach that does not presume or foreclose the unenclosed collective subject. By locating subjectivity in artistic genres, as Shapiro does, and in the metonymic predications of the subject, as Spivak does, they do not presuppose a positive individual human subject to be discovered or encountered in research or analysis or in politics. If subjectivity, need, if subjectivity need not be confined to the individual human, can cities be aesthetic subjects? Many of the figures that Shapiro analyzes as aesthetic subjects are characters in films or novels. In this regard, for Shapiro, the subject retains its locus or flavor as an individual human subject. Uh, thus, in his studies in Time in the City, cities are primarily settings or spaces uh, that stage particular kinds of encounters. There is nonetheless a certain hint of the city as subject in Shapiro's descriptions. So for example, Shapiro treats the city uh, in terms of the states of encounter that it, quote, proposes in time in the city. Shapiro's choice of the verb here, propose, resonates with Spivak's account of the idealist predication. In proposing states of encounter, the city shows its irreducible intendedness towards these set stagings. Thus in Shapiro's conception of the aesthetic subject, there is no reason to foreclose forms of subjectivity that are not confined to individual humans, as in the liberal subject. Forces of decision, drives, desires, intended to us towards the object, right? And actions or affects, the creative make, creatively making of the world, can center on collectivities as well as on individuals and on a range of materials, including the fabric of the urban. 
China Medieval's accounts of the fictional cities give us some important hints about the political possibilities of cities as aesthetic subjects. Now, for those of you who don't know, I imagine you do, Medieval writes across a range of genres, notably science fiction and fantasy, but also young adult fiction, nonfiction, and crime fiction. His imagined cityscapes depend on extensive world building. In Perdido Strait Station, the city of New Kerbozone is situated at the confluence of rivers that define it as a center of trade and commerce, while also staging radical inequalities and class divisions, as well as social and, and personal relations that amongst radically other characters, for example, interspecies romances. Radical encounters with otherness are also staged in the bodies of convicts who are altered with machinery to make them useful to society. Here a clear interpolation of the subject. The staging of strange encounters is the basis of the plot in the last days of New Paris, set in the 1950s Paris, where the Second World War is ongoing in the city, while manifestations of surrealist art experiments and magic encroach, are weaponized, and are invoked against the Nazis. Now, in each of these novels, the super adequacy of the city to itself, its transformative labor power of these stagings, builds worlds that are more than assemblage of their elements. The manifestations or manifs of New Paris assemble themselves from the random elements encountered in surrealist experiments, the umbrella beating the sewing machine on the operating table. But they do not remain on the operating table. They act or they suffer according to their own logics. Unlondon is a young adult novel set uh, between contemporary London and its mirror opposite, an inverse city that emerges from the rejects and detritus of the city. Here, London's super adequacy becomes a threat as the smog that once threatened the health and well-being of London gains consciousness. In Unlondon, uh, in Unlondon, and works with city bureaucrats in London to colonize the minds of the city. The setting, London, thus produces its antagonists not simply through the intendedness or proposing, but through the energy of the materials that normal city life discards in its ordinary operations. Materials whose surplus value becomes an excess that valorizes itself not only in, in parallel markets, but also in social conflict. Staging an encounter, assume, uh, staging an encounter assumes uh, distinct entities encountering each other. We might assume boundaries or borders between things that make them that might then encounter each other, which is a familiar theme in border studies. Borders are enormously important in Mieville's work, and he problematizes them in ways that will be familiar to IR scholars. Embassy Town is a, is a colony in Arica, a distant planet, so distant that it, is not, that it is not clear in the novel that the planet even remains in our universe. Nonetheless, as a colony, Arica is the hub of trade in exotic goods and a port for exotic forms of travel. It is home to both the hosts from the planet and a range of migrant species that interact through trade and diplomacy. The important border in the novel, however, is not the space that separates and connects it to other worlds, it is the problem of language. The Araki language is based on simultaneous expression of an idea and the speaker's state of mind. There is the, therefore no fiction, no metaphor, and no lying in their language. When they become vulnerable to manipulation by the colonizers, the novel's main protagonist must teach them how to speak with metaphors and to lie in order to resist this new form of domination. Unlondon is separated from London by barriers that are not evident in everyday life, as they exist even exist in everyday objects and places. Thus, there are familiar bridges, but there are bridges with no fixed beginnings or ends. There are libraries, but the connections between titles and the stacks carry the explorer up and out of London in treacherous climbs. Here, the sentiment of the marvelous in the everyday is taken to productive, a productive end, as London's marvelous double must defend itself from the very forces that created it. The border separating London from unlondon appears in the novel as a physical separation that only people with certain talents can recognize and cross. However, in the city and the city, the two cities in question occupy the same space. The border is practiced by the inhabitants who must go about their daily lives while unseeing the other city. The tense relations between these two cities are kept in check through both the diplomatic relations that are conducted across these virtual borders and through the deeply ingrained practice of unseeing. Traffic is controlled by unseen cars in the other city, for example. Seeing the other city is a serious crime called breaching. To keep people in their places, breaches can only be investigated by a special committee comprised of members of each city's council, but the murder of a young student whose body is dumped in the other city unleashes a series of events that begin to reveal a third controlling force that maintains the separation of these two cities. <laughs> 
The notion of unseeing then, and especially being trained to unsee from childhood, engages the political aesthetics that Shapiro takes from Rancier. In Miavel's more fantastic novels, such as Perdido Street Station, the characters must recognize and occupy their places because they are viscerally marked by and for their place. The humanoid insect capari uh, live in places marked by the constructions produced by the secretions from their bodies. The Garuda fly, the humans work in warehouses and abattoirs, etc. In Unlandun, the denizens of the fantastical version of the past come to life recogniz recognizably out of place and out of time in London. In the city in the city, though, these separations require severe policing and are shown to be even more vulnerable. Now, I'm not going to try and draw any conclusions from this work in progress, but here's what we're trying to explore. Much of the current literature on global cities treats the city in the same way that conventional political science treats the subject as a psychological subject, in terms of the qualities attributed to the city as it seeks to become a node in global networks. The notion of the aesthetic city, or the city as an aesthetic subject, contributes to a disrupting of the conceptual, subjective, and spatial hierarchies of the local within the global. This challenge is critically inclined, inclined scholars to see, feel, and know the urban global politics interface differently by attending to neglected sites, subjects, and methods. We respond to this challenge by rethinking the political subjectivity of urbanization. We ask, what global politics can be seen, felt, and known when we approach the city as an aesthetic subject? In Nieval's novels, numerous contexts shape the emergent political subjectivities. Occupation in the last days of New Paris, colonization in Embassy Town, precarization and environmental damage in London, ethnic identity and conflict in the city and the city. In each case, the emergent political subjectivity stems from a disruption in the, disru in the distribution of the sensible. What Miavel provides us is a view of the city as a subject that can provoke these disruptions, not a mere setting for the encounters, but a condensation of productive forces that makes and enlarges the field of possibilities for subjectivity. Hmm. Three minutes. Nope, done. You're done, wow. <laughs> You can give Maya my three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that, Matt. Um, lots of questions there, I think. Um, if everyone could sharpen their questioning knives, <laughs> we'll come back uh, after the next uh, panelist to all of your questions. So don't, don't forget to, uh, what we're going to do there is you can either share your question in the chat or you can raise your hand when we get there. Uh, but for now, in a very visa, on visa kind of way, if, if such a world were to exist, uh, we move to the aesthetic subject of Maya Zephus. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, uh, for your very kind introductions. It's definitely the first time I've been called both illustrious and an aesthetic subject, so it's a good day already. Um, I should warn you that my paper is very much work in progress. I'm very much better at telling you what sorts of questions I think we need to ask, then I am at answering them. Um, but I think that's all important, obviously. Um, and I want to start uh, with a vignette about a scandal, a political scandal, that I think we are at risk at of forgetting, since we have so much choice at the moment, of scandals in the political realm. And I should also uh, note for the UK participants that I have chosen to introduce this uh, in a way that makes it accessible for those of us who don't permanently uh, are in tune with UK politics. So you probably know much of what I'm about to say. Okay, here it goes. In 2015, Paulette Wilson's pension was cancelled. She was informed that she had to leave, uh, that she had no leave to remain in the UK. She had come to the UK from Jamaica in 1968. In 2016, Anthony Bryan was arrested in an immigration raid at his home and detained as an illegal immigrant. He had come to the UK from Jamaica as a child in 1965. In 2017, Sylvester Marshall was asked to pay over 50,000 pounds for his can cancer treatment in the supposedly free and national health service um, up front, unless he could show his British passport. He had come to the UK in 1973 as a young man. Those of us who live in the UK know these names. We know Wilson's, Bryan's and Marshall's stories because Amelia Gentleman investigated and wrote them for The Guardian, revealing what came to be known as the Windrush scandal. 
Later investigations showed that the Home Office had classified at least 164 people who entered the UK between 1948 and 1973 as illegal immigrants because they were unable to prove their right to be in the United Kingdom. A much larger group, an estimated 57,000, were potentially affected, all legal long-term residents who were unable to prove their status because they had never applied for a UK passport, but because they were also not subject to immigration controls and therefore did not have something like a visa. They had entered the country when any British subject could. When the 1971 Immigration Act ended this free movement, their rights had been protected automatically, but they had not been provided with paperwork to prove their status. Decades later, the authorities in the United Kingdom decided to classify those unable to prove otherwise as illegal, confusing uh, not having papers with not having permission. This meant that the affected people lost their work or pension, uh, their housing often, and access to health care. Some of these legal long-term residents were detained and deported, including over 60 who were actually British citizens. While the majority uh, of those affected were from the Caribbean, others from the Commonwealth were also affected. Of course, we all knew this was going on, since Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, had proudly declared that she wanted to create a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants in the UK. So this so-called hostile environment policy had been going on for years, but the public only really took notice when uh, the, the so-called Windrush scandal broke in 2018. The stories gentleman tells are of people confused by what happened to them and often too embarrassed to speak about it even with their own families. They were British at home in the UK. How could the Home Office possibly think they were illegals? They assumed that their predicament was unusual, that some mistake had been made and often that it was their fault. They also did not have the resources to fight the state. Contrary, however, to the expectation that the public accepts or even demands the harsh treatment of immigrants, when The Guardian published these individual stories of those affected, the public reacted with shock, anger and dismay. They saw that people had been treated callously. Instead of applauding the exclusion of relatively poor and predominantly black people, the public's reaction produced those affected as hardworking folk who helped rebuild Britain after the Second World War. Popularly, those affected are called the Windrush generation in reference to the Empire Windrush, which brought people to the UK from the West Indies in 1948. We are talking here, however, really of the children of this Windrush generation. At any rate, they were British. Their Britishness came to be celebrated in the story of their post-war contribution, even if it was that of their parents, retrospectively making them into something of a national treasure. The Windrush scandal highlighted the outrageous way in which the Home Office treats people more generally. This led to renewed criticism of the hostile environment policy and the associated culture of disbelief and racism within the Home Office specifically. Now, while the government continues to portray what happened as regrettable mistakes, sorry, these people shouldn't have been declared illegal, there's something went deeply wrong here. Critics, however, point out that the problems were both foreseeable and indeed foreseen, and that they stand in a long tradition of exclusionary immigration policies in the aftermath of empire and the exploitation of racialized people and the socioeconomically disadvantaged in particular. The so-called mistakes were in fact a direct, out direct outcome of the policy's design. So prima facie, this is very much a British problem. Yet the UK, uh, the UK is of course not alone in treating immigrants badly. And after having told this story, it seems difficult to say, but the UK is not even uh, perhaps particularly egregious in its immigration policies. 
So, in fact, uh, what Colin Yeo calls a government orchestrated discrimination is a direct outcome of the spatialization of global politics, or at any rate, that's what I want to suggest, which produces political subjectivity as connected to place. As Barry Hindes points out, modern citizenship constitutes a conspiracy against the former. It is therefore important to investigate the imaginary of global politics expressed in immigration and citizenship norms. It provides the conditions of possibility for an immigration system that selects long-term legal residents and even citizens to be shunned, to be turned destitute, and to deny that their home is where they say it is, where they have lived for decades, all the while presenting the state doing all this as embracing the rule of law and even being open to the world. What is more, sure, there was an outcry when the Windrush scandal broke, but nothing much seems to have changed. In fact, in many ways, the discourse about the scandal reinforced the trope of the good immigrant. We were to embrace the Windrush generation for the contribution they made to rebuilding Britain after the Second World War, leaving unexamined and unchallenged the notion that immigrants' presence must be justified, and indeed the appropriateness of treating anyone in the way in which Wilson, Bryan, and others have been treated. So we must ask, I think, about how all this comes to be normalized. How is it that discrimination against non-citizens is considered normal and indeed necessary? So what I do in this paper is to briefly set out how this problematic is shaped, I think, by the, global, uh, by the spatialization of global politics, why I think we need to take temporality much more seriously than we do, and why ultimately this affects us all and not just those positioned as migrants. So just a brief word on terminology. When I say migrants in this paper, what I mean is those positioned legally or politically as international migrants. I have much more to say on this, but in the interests of time, I won't. So asserting that long-term legal uh, residents really belong elsewhere relies on our spatial understanding of politics. The idea that people normally live where they are from. This is where we have citizenship and therefore rights. As Peter Nyash points out, everyone is meant to have a proper place in the world. And this is indicated by citizenship. Thus, the global spatial imaginary asserts a natural alignment of population and territory. Normally, we are led to believe everyone is from somewhere and this is where they belong. Against this background, migrants appear as people who are out of place as they are not in their state. This, it must be noted, is a normative judgment. It normalizes the privileging of citizens over others. Um, the system also has significant practical consequences for states. They must determine who must enter and remain on their territory, something that has increasingly come to be seen as a central function of state sovereignty. Put differently, based on the spatial global imaginary, creating and defending borders is necessary. In fact, as mobility has increased, an ever more complex and costly apparatus appears to be necessary to enforce the supposedly natural uh, assigned alignment of persons with territory. There are, of course, many critiques of this imaginary, both long-standing and in response to current developments. I won't go into these, though a few points are worth noting. First, the violence of the border is not an accident. The system requires and normalizes discrimination against those produced as not in their proper place, those construed as from elsewhere. Second, while this may actually be an embarrassment to states viewing themselves as subscribing to values expressed not least in human rights, the political imagination is trapped in the spatial grid that tells us that abandoning borders altogether is impossible and so the violence of borders must remain. The spatial grid dictates that citizens are distinct from migrants. Citizens are imagined as in possession of full political subjectivity. Restrictive immigration regulations are often presented as protecting these and as unifying communities, obscuring the internal divisions created as citizens have personal and effective relations with those positioned as migrants. What is more, such bordering reduces citizens' right not least in governing their relationships to non-citizens. Finally, 
There is much recent work that fruitfully highlights the racialized character of the putatively spatialized exclusions produced by the global state system. These often analyze the plight of refugees and migrants lacking authorization to cross borders. Racialization is clearly crucial in normalizing this uh, discrimination. What I am asking is what enables and normalizes this racialization. Why are migrants such a problem? Migration emerges as a problem against the backdrop of the spatialized imaginary of global politics. Migrants disrupt the order of people in their proper place. While thus apparently a spatial issue, migration necessarily takes place in time. It apparently requires movement. Despite this, existing work on migration seems to privilege spatiality. In critical scholarship, temporality is often refer referenced implicitly, focusing on process that is bordering instead of bo borders, emergence, potentiality, genealogy, and so on. For migrants themselves, time is certainly incredibly significant. The time spent waiting for status, deadlines and length of residency determining their status, policy changes over time affecting their status, and moving borders, to mention just a few of the most obvious way, ways in which time matters. For example, those affected by the Windrush scandal have been impacted by the temporal transformation of space. They moved to the UK when British subjects had the automatic right to do so. They did not migrate to a foreign country, but they are now forced to justify themselves legally and socially for having done so. So space only becomes meaningful in time. There is no space out of time and no time out of space. And time incidentally is very much not linear. Migrants often have to retrospectively account for something that was not actually a thing at the time. Since I suspect that not enough attention has been paid to temporality, I've been trying to listen out for it in migrant stories as well as conceptualizations of migration. So I was very struck by something Anthony Bryan said. Having been detained in what is euphemistically called a removal center and threatened with deportation after nearly half a century in the UK, what he recalls as particularly upsetting was being asked by a young immigration official why he did not go back to his country. So Brian says, he was a young man, not even 30. I'm 60. I've been here since before he's even born. Brian had lived in the United Kingdom longer than the official and reels at the way in which the significance of this time, his life, is denied. Brian's reaction at first seemed surprising even to me, um, and this is funny because I have much the same reaction to anyone suggesting that my life in the UK is somehow less meaningful because I'm not a citizen. I spontaneously sort of felt that I might be more angry to be detained in a removal center, to be de deprived of my liberty. But Brian is onto something. All that mattered to officials was that he came from elsewhere. He was not born in the British Isles and there was no record of his having entered the UK lawfully. That Brian had spent a lifetime in the UK mattered deeply to him, but counted for little in his struggle to have his lawful status recognized, at least as long as he could not prove it to the satisfaction of officials. The blasé attitudes toward where he actually spent the time of his life is reflected in the Home Office's risk assessment for his removal to Jamaica, which ignoring the fact that he had spent 49 of his 57 years in the UK stated that, and I quote, it is considered that you would be returning to a country where you have social, cultural and lingual tiles having resided there for the majority of your life. Three minutes. It isn't just Brian who thinks that our lives matter. The public's reaction to the Windrush scandal was in no small part related to how the individuals affected had been in the UK. Even then Home Secretary Amber Rudd expressed disbelief that people who had been here for 30 or 40 years had been treated in this way. There is surely an irony in that the Home Office's risk assessment for Brian's deportation suggests that spending time somewhere leads to personal and cultural entanglements, while at the same time acting as if they only matter where people are from and not where they have actually spent their life. <laughs>
The privileging of spatiality has seems to mediate the meaning of time. Put differently, spatialization creates a twisted view whereby the sorts of connections that we make as part of our lives must be at home and must remain missing in migrants' country of residence where they are forever produced as having just arrived. Let me conclude despite the fact that I have not yet reached much by way of conclusion. The way in which some of us are positioned as migrants concerns us all. It concerns us to be sure because it produces and maintains inequality. It does so in a way that is clearly classed and clearly raced. The apparent equality, everyone is thought to be a citizen somewhere, masks and normalizes the effective inequality of the system. Put differently, the spatialization of global politics underpins the belief that there is equality in everyone having their proper place. There are a number of problems with this idea, but most urgently for migrants, this proper place is not here where they live, but wherever they supposedly come from, it is where others, others tell them their home is. My work seeks to build on existing attempts to reconceptualize spatiality, temporality, and their relation in global politics. While I pursue my analysis by tracing time, this must not be at the expense of thinking space. Both conceptualizations of time and of space have been at risk of, at risk of denying, the co denying coevalness, which seems closely related to racialization. What interests me then specifically is how to capture and take seriously the multiplicity of stories of how time space is made personally, culturally, legally, and philosophically, and how that matters politically. That is what interests me is how we live together, how we produce political subjectivity in light of being both an instance of a category, citizens or migrants, and yet absolutely singular. What is at stake in state orchestrated discrimination against migrants is what political subjectivity amounts to for each of us, whether we happen to be a citizen of the place we live in or not. Put differently, how is it that we accept as normal and necessary the enormous costs for all of us of excluding migrants? Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. There's a lot of food for thought in there, isn't there? Um, there's a lot of questions uh, that won't necessarily easily be resolved, but I hope you, you uh, come to a very fruitful conclusion with it because we're all waiting to read that paper. Thank you. I'm, I'm hoping so too. Okay, everybody. Um, we're going to open the floor now to questions. Um, I'm going to switch over to gallery view so that I can see uh, your hands being raised. Um, I think there is, there should be a way of indicating, um, or you can literally just raise your hand. That'll be fine. Or let us know in chat that you've something to ask. Actually, I can't see where to raise your hand. I thought it was under reactions, no? Um. It's on the participants. Ah, there we go. There, I'm raising my hand now. Okay. Who has the first question? Everyone's absorbing these uh, wonderful topics. While everyone thinks, can I just uh, ask Hattie a clarification, which is um, more admitting my ignorance. Um, you use the term uh, at some point in, in your paper, temporal bricolage. Is that your own term or you were at that stage, I think talking about Susan Buck Morse, does she talk about it? And can, can you tell me a little bit more about that. I, I wasn't fully switched on because I was waiting for my own paper to come on, so I may have missed your explanation at the time. 
Do you want me to answer now, Patrick? Or? Okay. Um, I will be entirely honest with you. I don't quite remember whether that's me or her. Uh, I, <laughs> I suspect it's her, but I don't want to um, promise in either direction, um, put words in her mouth. But what I um, sort of sort of remember of it is, is, the, is the way that she's talking about these placing kind of obvious symbols of modernity in Paris as kind of the, the galleries and the, and the widened boulevards and things like this uh, next to older you know buildings and things like this in order to dictate sort of where people ought to go what was modern so it's kind of having these symbols of modernity next to I guess old things um, which, yeah, creates a sensation of what you should be doing in a place. Okay, thanks. I also had a question for you, Hattie, if that's okay. Um, when you were talking about, um, so you talked, I suppose, a little bit about temporality and about influence. And you were saying before the road was being fixed, everyone was complaining about it. So there's this kind of affective atmosphere of annoyance. And then the governor comes along and goes, we're going to fix this. We're fixing it for tourists and for the economy and so on. And, and then we get to how people react to that afterwards. And I wasn't sure what, what was the connection. Were we saying that the reaction of individuals who are now using the road and ideating about uh, people mm -hmm. as being um, paradise was dependent on the speech acts by elites, if you like, you know, and, uh, can you break that down a bit more for me or, or, or was the, are we saying that the um, governor was reflecting the view of the people? W what was that, what was that relationship? I don't think it's either of those um, in, a, in a sort of direct sense. Uh, it certainly wasn't the case that people were, um, you know, really excited that the governor had said these specific things. Although I will note that there were um, sort of, especially in the towns along the road, um, residents associations and things like that. Um, I was actually living in, in one of them at the time, kind of held parties, set, uh, kind of thanking the governor for um, putting this road in because it makes their life so much easier in terms of how easy it is um, to get to PIPA. Um, so there, there is an interesting relationship to elites in that sense, but I certainly don't think it was, you know, this quote that he said to the state paper that was um, what made people react in that way. I think that there was, you know, like a, a kind of... Um, critical mass of people calling for this road to be repaved and this is something that had been going on for for many years um before i got there um in terms of you know it, it made kind of life kind of hard like the potholes were were significant but yeah so i, I suppose it more in that direction but i think just to say it's a response to the people living there would be kind of to miss i think a lot of this idea of of the way that tourism has this kind of like privileged position in in the state so for me it is much more about bringing in something that 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 uh facilitates tourism as opposed to necessarily a direct relationship mm -hmm. between what the elites are saying and what people are, are reacting to thank you that really cleared that up for me I, I understand much better now thank you um we have a raised hand uh christina would you like to go with your question hello thank you um Thanks all three. That was really exciting and stimulating. Um, I, I do still have to digest a lot more. I think um, I've got a question for all three of you, and that might be a bit off, but that's kind of what my brain did while, while I was listening to all of you. And that's the, that's the relationship between um, becoming, because all of you describe processes of becoming um, a subject or within within a discourse um, the making of the building of or so so broadly becoming um, all three of you also describe various versions of contempt contemptuousness um, had he put that a little, not quite in that language but you know if, if if you're talking about social hierarchy then we do regard or certain people come to be regarded as you know be 
being less or so so there's inequality coming in um and then and then intentionality which i think for our our theoretical approaches is a bit difficult but looking at looking at how how some some of the subject making and 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 becoming as phrased in public discourses and also by people um there's an there are narratives of intentionality at least put on in order to explain and that might be both good and bad so so the intentionality of getting rid of unwelcome people but also the intentionality of building the paradise um and then and then this is this is a question particularly to you matt and please bear with me maybe i'm completely getting this wrong but i'm really interested in that um was your reference to the super adequacy to itself so you know there's a kind of intentionality if i'm if i'm understanding that concept right there too um so this it's bear with me it's a kind of hazy sort of question to all three of you but i'm interested in those re relationships um to tease out maybe a little bit more how complicated these things are mm -hmm. because we do tend to fall back into if not binaries but you know kind of categories that make sense and so um, i i suppose i'm wondering about intentionality in all of this thank you who wants to start with that should we yeah, Hattie, do you want to, to begin? And then we'll no. come to that. No? Um, I'm just thinking, sorry. <laughs> we'll come, we'll come, we'll come to you in a moment. Um, Matt, do you want to start? I'll, I'll take a quick stab. Um, it is, I think, Christine, thank you so much. I mean, it is, a, you know, I guess part of what happens when we write is we try to take things that are messy and complex and try to make them into something that's comprehensible. And that's kind of an, always an act of violence, but the alternative is to leave it incomprehensible, right? So I'm not, not quite sure I'm going to be able to do justice to the question here. I, I can start, I think, a little bit with um, a simple level. Uh, well, it's not simple at all, actually, because it's Gaia Spivak, but, but the, 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 the fu fundament to the question you asked that was aimed towards me was about this relationship between the notion of intentionality and the notion of the superadequacy of the subject. And for Spivak, the first thing is, is that those are um, two different predications of the subject which are mutually exclusive. So the, the idealist predication is the one where you look at the, the subject as being irreducibly intended towards an object. And you can see that in psychoanalysis, right, the object relations kind of thinking. But it's also just the way that language works, right? So in the structure of a sentence, so the, the subject and predicate relationship is always something which is aimed at something else. So intentionality is kind of written into the language already. Less of a problem of theoretically accounting for agency, more just a, a way of describing how language itself works. The, she uses the word of the superadequacy of the subject in relation to the materialist predication of the subject. That's to say, the materialism as in Marxism. And that's why it's related to labor power. So the, there the super adequacy comes from the fact that the, the act of working produces more value than the value it takes to produce the labor that does the production. In other words, there's, that's where the super adequacy comes, comes into her conception here. Um, what, what she, if this is a complicated essay. I mean, it's one I've probably read 30 times. I'm not really sure I completely grasp what she's, arriving at there. It's a very densely argued piece, um, but, but what I'm, at least for now, taking from this is, is that, the, that even though those two predications are uh, mutually exclusive, we can't really talk about subjectivity without them, right? In other words, there's a, there's, that's aporia, right? That's, that's the, the aporia of the subject is the way that it is both this and this other thing, while, not, while those two things are not reconcilable. Now, the other thing about this, and this is, this is I'm going to try and take this into your notion of becoming, right? Because you could actually take all of that as, and I think it's probably slightly a, a fair cop on, on Derridian or Gayatri Spivak on this kinds of thinking, is, is that because it is itself kind of an, an idealist predication subject, that is to say it's always locating itself in language primarily, um, we can we we might want to then, we might be tempted to, to, to lift the problem of the subject out of the body and out of embodied relationships and into something which um, 
has a mainly textual kind of existence. Now, Spivak isn't wanting to do that. That's why she's actually landing, in some sense, on the side of the Marxist account in her essay. But I think that that's also what allows us to think about these um, metonymic accounts as being part of subjects in process or subjects in formation, or, you know, to use the language you put it, is as, as becoming. And I, I think that if that might, at least for my purposes, to try and think of cities as subjects, that's actually crucial, right? Because otherwise, you know, the city, because it presents itself to us mainly as the built environment, right, as, as already in place things, um, we might really miss the way that, well, cities are actually always in movement, always in process. And if, and if, and to catch them as subjects means to understand the built environment, not as built, but as being built by itself and by the, the, uh, the subjects and subjectivities that it mobilizes. Um, now, that, that's the answer to your question, and what I'm, what I'm still working on now is this, can I take that kind of critique to the kind of planetary urbanization and to the kind of um, global cities literature and the various ways that, that cities are being to show up in terms of trying to rethink the space of politics for IR. Um, and there I would have to maybe say I'm not quite there yet. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Thank you, Matt. Maya, would you like to have any comments on that? Give it a go. Um, I'm not sure I entirely understood the question as a singular question. It seemed to be more a riff on a, on a number of concepts, so I'm going to riff back, I suppose. Um, I mean, I, I obviously have a not terribly good relationship with intentionality, which I tend to think is um, overestimated in its significance in many narratives. Um, intentionality cannot govern what happens and therefore um, invocations of intentionality often have the character of uh, I didn't mean it honest. So in the sense, in the Windrush scandal, um, the government saying, well, we didn't intend to deport these people. We just wanted to deport these other people who are deserving of this kind of treatment. Uh, to me, il illustrates the problem with in intentionality. And I'm obviously, uh, as many of you will know, uh, inspired by a Derridian analysis of the problem of intention in, in saying that. Um, I was intrigued by, by what you were saying about contempt or contemptuousness, which is not a terminology that I used um, and then initially thought I don't have terribly much to say about this. Uh, but I suppose part of what I'm trying to do is to track where a contempt happens when we are not looking. Um, so we all know that there's class prejudice and that there's race prejudice and so on. And, and um, people are very fruitfully tracing these processes. But I suppose what intrigued me about Brian's comment about I'm older than this guy and he's trying to tell me, you know, that, that my life has no meaning is uh, that it comes at a, it, it comes in a, in a surprising package, um, he's, he's pointing out the very contemptuousness uh, of saying it doesn't matter that you've been here for 49 years, I can still tell you where you're really from and where you should be. Um, and so, so I'm kind of intrigued about this. Um, one of the other things that, that you were talking a little bit about in, in your comment is this that we always fall back into dichotomies. And this is definitely both a problem and an opportunity, I suppose. I mean, it's certainly a problem when one gives a short paper and is trying to delete all of the in brackets, but it's more complicated than this type uh, situations because it just, you know, it doesn't make any sense in the presentation. But I'm obviously always intrigued by the both and uh, that Matt has, has already commented on, um, that I, I'm deeply suspicious about the possibility of dichotomies. That is to say, of course, dichotomies are possible. We use them all the time. But the idea that an actual subject, an actual person can ever fit um, 
such a dichotomy or that an actual situation that I'm trying to explain will ever um, precisely fit is precisely wrong. There will always be something that exceeds it and, and therefore uh, something that leads to uh, becoming, although that isn't a ter terminology I currently use. So I don't know whether that responds in any way uh, to what you were thinking, uh, but that's what, what your comments sort of uh, make me think for, for the moment. Thanks, Maya. Hattie, is there anything you want to add? I don't know that I've got anything particularly useful to add to this because it's, it's basically something I have to go away and um, really think about. Um, Especially, I don't know, yeah, the kind of like the, the, the problem of intentionality there, because I think that's something that I am, in the case of people, kind of loathe to award to any of the things that have been going on. It's actually kind of almost a common complaint that there's no intentionality whatsoever in people and the place just kind of happened. Um, and, you know, so it's, it, it's kind of interesting to think of things in this way and, and then, yeah, what becoming um could be in in those regards um because i don't think it's like an engineered exclusion uh, i think this is this is just something mm -hmm. that's emerged over time so yeah that's a kind of yeah what, what i'm thinking about on that but i haven't um got anything about thanks hattie christina did you want to reflect on any of those responses No, I, I seem to think, um, I seem to have, have, have overwhelmed um, everybody successfully with that question, for which I'm sorry, but I'm also really excited by your answers because I, I, for me anyway, all of your answers were really meaningful and, and, and added something to your presentation. So I'm very deeply grateful for bearing with me. Um, thanks. Thanks, Christine. I, Clear. I mean, I, I thought your, your provocations, even though I called them a rip, uh, were interesting in making me think something else through, and I've written them down, and, and I intend to reflect further, so just to be clear about that. Maya, we're losing your sound a little bit. I wonder if your water bottle in front of your microphone. No? Possibly not. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> It's just probably me leaning back whilst I'm talking. It, it, could, it could well be. We have one more question. I think we have time for one more excellent question. It's from the also illustrious Patrick Pinkerton. Uh, Patrick? Thank you. This may not be an excellent question, but it, it shall be a question. Um, so, can, yeah, this can you hear me again? So, um, uh, I guess firstly, so thanks to everyone for the papers, really interesting. Um, to Matt, um, I really enjoyed your kind of thoughts on uh, Gina Neville. Um, so the only book of his I've read is uh, The City in the City. Um, you kind of make me want to, to look at more of them. They all sound very interesting. Um, I guess I was just wondering, do you have any thoughts about, you know, how you go from that type of analysis of, of his writings of this kind of science fiction? You know, how do you then make the kind of steps into uh, analysing, you know, real or historical or contemporary examples of, of cities. So obviously the city in the city being about this incredible kind of divided city. Um, I just, you know, obviously been, I'm, as someone from, from Belfast, which has its parts of it being uh, divided, other parts being shared, having the history of changing division. And there's obviously lots of contemporary and historical examples of divided cities. So I guess, yeah, I just wondering you know, how, do you, how, do you, how do you hope or uh, plan or, I aspire to make the step from kind of the discussion of this, the science fiction to the kind of the social science, I guess. Although probably none of us use that term anyway. Um, and then for Hattie and Maya, I guess just to throw in another dichotomy. Um, I guess so. The dichotomy I'm interested in is the dichotomy between, I guess, being mobile and being settled. So I was wondering, is just again, if you have any. Uh, any further thoughts on that or how that relates to what you were talking about? So Hattie was obviously talking about the kind of sensation of freedom of mobility. You know, to what extent is this, you know, a construction? Do people actually want to remain settled? And then with Maya talking about, you know, people people affected by Windrush obviously had moved originally, but then, yeah, the, as you said, the kind of the retroactive change to their uh, the status of that mobility 
which then prevented them sort of remaining settled in, in the present. So just, yeah, if you have any further, any, it'd be really interesting for me to hear any thoughts you have on on the, the nature of that kind of dichotomy in your work. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I, I noticed that at the beginning you were using the rhetoric of diminuendo, where you were putting yourself down, when in fact there were two excellent questions to come. So um, shall we go to Matt first for your particular question, Matt, if you don't mind? Yeah, and I'll try to be brief because I know time is short and I tend to wrap it on. Um, but, but I think I can answer fairly directly. If I were to offer a criticism of the way that Mike Shapiro formulates his notion of the aesthetic subject as being the subject we encounter in artistic genres, I would wonder why we need the qualification artistic. Right, what is it, when you, when, if you're encountering the city in China Meville's novels, what you're encountering is something which, you know, he as a writer conceived, planned, experimented with, wrote down, changed, re remade. And when you encounter Belfast, you're doing something that was done in a very similar fashion by lots of different people over a certain amount, over a longer period of time. So I don't think methodologically it's actually necessary to draw a distinction between how I might encounter the city in a novel versus how I encounter a city as I'm walking around. There, that, that might be a bit of an overstatement in a way, because, you know, obviously when I'm reading a novel, there's a very particular haptic relationship that's different than the one that I have when the fuller sensorium is being engaged as I'm walking through a city. But I think it's some, but at the same time, I don't, you know, I think obviously a writer who can invoke the smells of a city or the sounds of a city or the feeling of fear when you're in a place you shouldn't be, isn't really doing something that different to the way that the city itself operates on our bodies. So I, I, th I think, you know, without wanting to be, t I'm doing this because it's, it's like 1459 and I know that I want to give time to the others. So I'm going to sound like I'm being very rude, but I kind of doubt the premise of your question. Let me put it that way. And you did too, by the way, because you kept qualifying everything you're saying about we wouldn't say social science anymore. Well, there's a reason we kind of moved away from that kind of language. Thank you, Matt. Um, to the second question, Maya, do you want to take that first? So there are all kinds of, presumptions between uh, being mobile and, and, and being settled and, and clearly politically speaking, uh, being mobile is often associated with mobility across borders when in fact, um, you know, no one is settled in, in the kind of way that is apparently being valorized, i.e. staying in the same place all the time. I mean, a lot of people move around. It uh, suddenly becomes weird when you cross a border and it marks you as permanently uh, mobile. But there's also an, an interesting kind of a normative injunction going on, a, a sort of moralizing about being mobile and being settled. And, and here the interesting thing is that primarily being settled seems to be the default, the right thing, the, 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 the morally appropriate and so on. But it kind of depends, you know, when you're poor and there are jobs elsewhere, then you're supposed to be mobile. So it's much more complicated. And, and that maybe comes back actually to this earlier question about contempt and contemptuousness. When being settled is a, an occasion for contemptuousness and when being mobile is that sort of uh, thing, it really depends on the specific situation. Um, because we're quite able to also think negatively about somebody who doesn't want to move despite the fact that there would be jobs that would lift them out of poverty and level them up and, and God knows what else um, elsewhere. So I'm afraid time's up. So we need to have this conversation elsewhere, Patrick. <laughs> Thank you from other Patrick. Hattie, a, a quick thought before we close? Um, basically, yes. Uh, echo a lot of what of what Maya just said um just in terms of I actually I do find this binary between being fixed and mobile is something really kind of troubling quite a lot of the time and I think this works on 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 so many levels in terms of the effects that it has I think it's just kind of important to note just in relation to what I'm trying to do a little bit is is the big idea of being a fixed or mobile person and in the context in this sort of context rather than, than, than thinking of it as like a socio-economic flow right of just kind of like things that that, that that happen this is all 
people being produced that way in relation to one another. You know, one person only becomes fixed by merit of the other person being mobile. And I think tourism is a really interesting way of, of, of really troubling the understanding of that. You know, like mobility isn't something that, it's like not an identity, you know, it's not something that one has or one doesn't have. It's, you know, complicated, basically. Hattie, thank you very much indeed for clear thinking and brevity. Um, those are two rich qualities that have been on display today, I think, from everybody. Um, so we're just after three o'clock. Um, first of all, thank you to everybody for attending. We really, really appreciate you being here.